this wasn't my calling. Um, so in the last semester of school, before graduating, still no idea what I was going to do with my life. Um, I took an entrepreneurial class, which uh, made us create a business proposal. I was put in a group with uh, four girls and one guy, and they wanted to do a uh, flower shop. And I was like, guys, this professor's been teaching this class for 10 years. I guarantee you he's seen you know, 30 or 40 flower shops. Let's do something outside the box. And so I came up with the idea of a butcher shop. Uh, and so, as I suggested, I kind of grabbed a lot of horns and did a lot of research and a lot of work on the project and uh, knocked out most of it by myself. But while I researched it, you know, I, I stumbled on videos of Dario Cicchini and uh, Renzo Garibaldi, and uh, I just, I really saw what a butcher could do. It was more than a person that cuts meat. You know, you bring, you bring life to this. It's, it's an art form. You know, and, and Dario was a, a huge inspiration to me. I, I just saw that. You know, there's a character behind the butcher, you know. He can just do so much more with this craft. And uh, so it was about a month before I graduated, I told my parents, you know, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to be a butcher. Uh, you know, I'm going to open my own butcher shop. And uh, I got various reactions. Uh, my dad still thinks I'm a little crazy. Uh, people have told me, you know, you know, you went to, you went to school, you went to private school, you, you know, could have done business. and you're going to be a butcher, you know, it's, this isn't the 1700s, you know, there's other jobs out there. Anyway, uh, I did a lot of research, uh, started sending out a bunch of emails, places where I could begin apprenticing. Um, there's not really a, a formal butcher's educational program in Texas, and to that matter, there's not a lot of butchers in Texas, you know, it's all supermarkets, uh, there's not a lot of craft butcher shops or anything like that, so I didn't know really where to start. Um, I heard about a company, Fleischer's. Craft Butchery in New York City, and I applied to their uh, apprenticeship program. Uh, they couldn't take me right away. I had about a five-month gap after I graduated school to, to Fleischer's, so a good family friend of mine recommended I start working at a slaughterhouse uh, down in South Texas, which was a very uh, eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I feel like it gave me a very uh, broad view of the industry that I really have begun to appreciate more and more as I've uh, come along this journey. So I worked there at a slaughterhouse for five months. I worked on the kill floor in the packing house. I did a little bit of uh, service behind the meat counter. Just kind of got my toes wet in the industry. Um, most of what I was taught was taught in Spanish. So I really didn't uh, develop a full knowledge working at the slaughterhouse. But when I arrived in New York City, it was a very another eye-opening experience for me. It was uh, the first time I'd been thrust into a real food scene. Uh, Texas is very far behind their food. They love their McDonald's, their chicken fried steak, their Mexican food. So New York was a, was a really interesting opportunity to see what all is going out, on out there in the food scene. Also, I was given a very, very good education uh, there at Fleischer's. It was a paid, uh, I had to pay for the apprenticeship, but it was a three month long apprenticeship. I learned to break lamb, pork, and beef. Uh, learned a lot there, met some very good people. After that, I returned to Texas. Uh, at this time, I kind of I got a vlog going. I figured, you know, part of my uh, my mission is to, to educate people, you know, to continue that education. So I started this blog. I kind of coined the term the blogging butcher. Um, so I'm still running this blog now, uh, and it's just been kind of interesting to see how it's evolved. Um, so after a while, I did some more research. I found uh, Kate Hill through Renzo Garibaldi. Uh, Renzo. It said, you know, if you want to learn to surf, you go to California, but if you want to learn charcuterie, you go to France. And so I showed up in Gascony with my Stetson and cowboy boots and uh, took a class with Kate and uh, Dr. Michelle Fansteel. Um, very interesting course that, again, I kind of got my toes wet in the charcuterie game and, you know, I still had a thirst. I wanted to learn more. Um, at the time, I had also been in contact with uh, Dario Cicchini's wife, Kim, uh, for about a year. And uh, they'd been telling me, you know, we're not taking apprentices, we're not taking apprentices. And finally I emailed her and I said, you know, Kim, I'm, I'm here in Europe. You know, if there's any chance I can come by, I'd love just, you know, a day, a week, you know, to shop. So while I was at Kate's, uh, Kim responded. She said, yeah, absolutely, come by for a week. Um, so after we finished up Kate's class, I made my way to Panzano and uh, began to, to work with Dario and his butchers there. Uh, it's a totally different culture. Uh, than the American meat scene, uh, but I learned from 
his butchers and himself uh, over two months. <coughs> I also got to work in the, the restaurants there, which was very interesting to see how you can kind of integrate a butcher shop and restaurant. Uh, I actually learned some Italian as well, a lot of fun. I uh, ate a lot of good food. And um, as my family came over for a little vacation, I had planned to go back to America with them. Um, instead, I had been emailing Kate, seeing if it was possible to work with Dominique and really refine my cookery <coughs> skills. Um, finally, I heard back from Kate uh, when I was in Venice. She said, yes, come, you can he work with them. wrote a lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't know email. she was getting them, so it was, you know, probably around six or, I don't know, the number, but yeah. Uh, finally, she responded, and she said, yeah, you're going to have to rent a place, rent a car, but you can come work with Dominique. So as my family <coughs> flew back to America, I traveled to Toulouse, rented a car with standard tra transmission, which was totally foreign to me. Uh, so that was a trip just getting to Kate's house, but uh, I got it down now. We drove all over here. Uh, so then I worked with Dominic for the last two months, uh, just learning his, his ways of charcuterie with the traditional Gaskin uh, charcuterie recipes and processes. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Dominic. I've been kind of right there under his wing the whole time. And, you know, some of the best times have been just not necessarily cutting meat, but uh, building relationships with him during our lunch hour or lunch hours, as they sometimes extend sometimes pretty deep into the afternoon. Um, but it's been an honor to, to get to know Dominique. He's uh, one of the best men out there. He's very kind, very generous. Uh, and I, I've just been incredibly lucky, I feel like, with this whole journey. I've I've met some incredible butchers, incredible charcuteries, and some, some of the very best people that are on this planet. And I'm just lucky to be here. Uh, Michael had asked Kate and Dominique to come, and I happened to be hanging around, still making charcuterie with Dominique. And sure enough, I got to tag along. And because of my uh, visa troubles, we had to drive here. So, but we got a really awesome road trip on the way up here. Oh yeah, that yeah. I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> but, um, Michael, that's all I had. You know, do you have any questions or anything about the, the apprenticeship or educational side of? I, I have. Uh, how do how do you fund it? Uh, did you save up or? Did you um, so to to do my Fleischer's apprenticeship, I uh, sold my car. Uh, so I have no car waiting for me back in Texas. But uh, yes, that uh, funded my Fleischer's trip. Um, on the way back from New York, a lot of my things were lost through UPS. So. <laughs> I got some insurance money, which paid for Kate's class. <laughs> so it's, it's been, sponsored by UPS. Yeah, oh, sponsored in part by UPS. Um, and then my funds kind of ran out somewhere around Italy. Uh, so my mother's been very gracious, and she's uh, she's an artist as well, and she kind of sees my dream, and she wants to see me pursue it. So she has been graciously funding me uh, from here on out. But uh, yeah. What do you what do you see as the common thread? through your experiences with learning butchery under people who ideally represent the region that they're cutting in? I've, everywhere I've been, I, I've gotten a sense that everybody has a immense respect for, for what they're working with and, the, and, their, and their proteins. Um, you just don't see a lot of that in Texas. It's, you know, it's such a huge you know, beef producing state, but it's you know, a lot, of, a lot of beef is wasted, and it's, it's not near the quality that I've been working with. And just a general respect for the animal. Uh, Dario, you know, he's, he's a poet. He gets up there, and he, you know, quotes from the Divine Comedy while he's cutting up a huge porterhouse. And, um, you know, he's always singing praises of the beef. Um, so it, just a general respect for, for the animals. Pride in the work and reverence for the animal? Yes. Great. Anything else? What do you think might must change to get people uh, involved in, in, in being becoming a butcher? Is it the picture of the butcher? I mean, you talked about the the YouTube videos, and you saw some some people that are really promoting their uh, their craft. What do you see are the core points that attract young people to become a butcher? I think definitely it's it's part of the role models. You know, like Dario, you need those those rock star butchers out there promoting promoting the craft. But I think you also have to have the opportunities out there for, for people to get into the craft. Um, I think traditional apprenticeships are a great way to learn it. You know, um, I didn't really find any traditional learning uh, 
butchery schools, but you know I've you know just put you know a little bit of hard work into it and a bunch of emails and you know found people that are willing to you know take take a young person on and, and you know teach them the craft and, and you know it's a, it's a knowledge sharing thing. They just want to see their craft continue on, and I think that's the best kind of education you can get, just being right there under somebody's wing and learning as much as you can, just being fully immersed in it. But also there's respect towards the apprentices, not like. Because that's what I hear a lot. That in Germany, you know, the apprentice it's there to clean the floor, and you know, it's 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 not very attractive. Well, well that's part of it. You know, good. It's part good of it. Forty percent, of course. But <laughs> but I think one thing um, that what Jack has done, because we know Jack pretty well now, kind of consider him our, my Texas son, but um, he did what a hand only a handful of people have done over the years, which is he's dedicated enough to put himself out on the line, you know. When you sell your own car, so you can go do something. When you put yourself out in a, in a foreign country, you can't speak the language. But you say, I'll do it. I'll sell at the market. He sells at the market alongside Dominique and Christiane with a few grunts and nods and a few numbers now. And, but he's put himself out there in a way. And the persistence of the emails or the persistence to follow his passion is as important as our side to teach. So when we talk about apprenticeships, it's obviously sort of falls on the people to offer the apprenticeship. But I think his side to want it, to crave it, is as important. And I wish there were more of them around. So, but in, it, it's cost you thousands upon <coughs> thousands of dollars, which is a barrier to entry for the vast majority of people. So how, how do we create programs that cultivate that passion within the people but allow for it to be accessibility without that, that barrier to entry, because the only training available in the States comes at a very high cost. And you, 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 pay, you pay to go to classes, but how much is, uh, how, how much does it cost there? Uh, my $1, education $1, there was 7500 for three months. I think it's $7,500? I think it's 10000 now. Wow. Well, it used to be, wow, it used to be even more for less time. And, and, and how, oh, sorry, and they're, three months? They're, they're working. So the, it's free labor, it's not, it's, they're paying to work, so it's not just an education. I mean, they're, they're part of the production process, so, you know, they're getting paid twofold in the fact that they're getting free labor on top of being paid to be there to begin with. And that doesn't, does that include board and all that sort no, of stuff? No, uh, right. room board, you know, You're in New York was, City. Yeah, it was, it was so, an expensive learning So you have to, to pay for your stay there as well? Yes, yeah. Yes, that's all outside the 7500. But that's one of nice card. Oh, great. <laughs> um, that is one thing that I've seen here in Europe, though. Uh, you know, when I got to Dario's, he housed me, he fed me, you know, asked for, for no money. And the same with Dominique. Dominique tried to pay me, and I was like, no, I, you know, that you're, you were giving to me already. There's no reason that I should, I should be paid. And eventually, that's what I would like to do with my butcher shop is have a school and, and not charge anything. But, uh, you know, it... It is an expensive education I've gained, but I feel like it's part of giving back. You know, it's the only way to, to allow anybody to join this craft and carry on the tradition is to offer it free of charge. And I, I've had this discussion a lot with, with Kate and with people there in France. It, it would be difficult to vet, you know, who would be worth the time investing in and who's just going to jack around. And it, that's, that's a question I haven't answered. But... Ideally, I would like to give this education free of charge because I, I feel I've been given so much by by so many. It's it's the least I can do is to, to pass on what I've what I've learned. Some some cost that's that choice of who's going to do it though. I mean, selling your car in doing it. I mean, that's a that's a real show of commitment. Obviously, that maybe not everybody can do. But opening it up then to be free means that on a whim. I mean, and and farmers are dealing with this right now in America is the challenge of offering apprenticeships over the seasons to people for free and they don't actually realize how hard it is. And you have people who are taking these positions and then having to quit after one day, one week, one month, and, and then doing a disservice to the farmer himself who's then been reliant on that sort of thing. So it's not easy work, as you well know. I mean, the work can be very physical, especially if you're on a kill floor working with pole animals or things like that. Um, but certainly, I mean, having accessibility be part of, of it is, is, a, is a really important Absolutely. thing. I mean, Carrie Underly, who you know, and some of, I mean, some of you else might know, 
has been trying to figure out how to start a school, also around education. Um, the biggest cost is the meat. Yeah. How do you how do you learn? And so Fleischer's, of course, has a high volume production process, so they have the meat as part of their business model in order to support the education, which is really great. Um, but it's the most expensive part. You know? Well, we made it. I made a decision to put a, a dollar of a value price on the education. Yeah, we deliver a we deliver a course, the apprentice part that that um, Jack has been doing the last few months. Dominique is separate from that, but I thought it was important in the same way when we do workshops. You know, we set a value for that because people then value their education. If somebody absolutely can't pay, we can make it happen, and we do a lot. I funded a lot, especially for women, myself, to do that, and now I'm establishing an organization that will help on that with, uh, from other people's other sources. But I think it's important to put a value on your own education. You know, when I went to school, I worked my way through school. I didn't have rich parents. I didn't get a scholarship. I had to work. I don't think I'm any worse off for having done that. And I think somehow there has to be a way. Accessibility, yes, but placing a value. So that vets out to people who aren't serious, too. Yeah. It could be a work situation. Okay. I just, maybe I, I, Final question. Okay, I just want to give some input because the European situation, because we talk about America, the European, or for, for the German situation, it's like uh, there are lots of free uh, apprentices places where you get paid to learn how to become a butcher. You get not paid much, but you get paid. And the butchers can't find people to work there. So we have this other situation. And I think that's also, for them, it's a, it's hard to become uh, this, I don't want to always refer to Rockstar, but being the Fleischer's uh, place where people know that they're good and that they're uh, giving out good meat and you can learn something. Um, as soon as this happens, as with our butchery, we get five or <coughs> ten uh, people uh, handing in inquiries. They want to work at our place and they want to learn to be a butcher. And uh, that's the strange situation when you come up with, with your... Face and, and, and with some media and with some Facebook and stuff like people are coming, but I wonder how, how we change this. That in Europe there's lots of free space for free education. You get paid. You don't pay for the education, but people can work there because they are not interested or the, the butchers are not out there. And, and they have, have to make a commitment to it. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're trying to do before. All right. Just short so note. Yeah. Short note. Quick, quick because uh, what, what we have here in, uh, in Denmark, what I know of, we. we probably need some kind of a scholarship or how do you say an extra education where we learn because in schools they don't learn very much of what you talked about or what you've been learning by traveling by yourself. So it may, maybe uh, we discussed yesterday with uh, Annika and Hilbert uh, Malka about maybe Butch's Manifesto in some kind of way can can offer scholarships at the first time maybe at educated people. So because we have a lot of good crafters here where one month at Dominique, one month at Hennigor, one month at whatever will give a million to everything, and we have state school where we perhaps can make them do the kill. So, so it's a uh, it could be a start, for example, because I don't, I don't we don't have the buses right now to start a brand new education, but maybe we can make a international. How can we, I don't know what what is called uh, high school, college, whatever. Uh, thing who could be broken down if you could <coughs> be away for one month you can do it like this if you could be away for three months you could do it like this and fourth one that's it we, we have a time problem so but i believe but i believe <laughs> oh, that problem oh, no, no, no. but i believe that tonight uh, with the dinner because we have so much to discuss that we perhaps should make some discussions down there about some of the topics today where uh, yeah yeah and because there's very there's many interesting things here so, but we need to. Uh, time is really running. Um, sorry about that one. Okay, this is uh, something that I produced before today, so it might not work. It might work. But the thing is that um, I thought that education were about individuals, such as Jack, but also about the community itself. And then about institutions, we heard earlier today that at least government institutions are not really aware of some of the traditional traits that actually uh, gives a better product. Um, so you don't have to do all three. You can do the one that you f f 
or the two that you feel is most important. It doesn't really matter. And it's only for you to have a discussion that can pour over to be, again, a statement for education. So look for the drivers or the needs for these characters or the characters that you choose, but also how you will approach them. So in, in a statement kind of a way. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. I'm going to cut you on time, so I'll just figure out how much time, but no more than 20 minutes for this exercise altogether, so 15 and 5, like we did before, and then hopefully, even though it's very important, I think it's not as difficult as quality is, so, uh, so I hope that we will get there faster. One thing, nobody is allowed to sit in the same chair he has been sitting on before lunch, so please mix the...